tests are back on this week. And today I'm in an R170 Sport Light Compact. Hello, welcome back to Furious Driving and my first post-lockdown goes for a drive test drive in this, an R170 Mercedes SLK 320. But before we get going, what is going to be the new normal for everything I do in terms of car reviews and test drives in my other work as well, wiping down the hard points, touch points and interior with antibacterial car cleaner. The world we live in today. As the rules in England have been relaxed about going back to work this week and I can't realistically test to drive a car in my living room, I'm here at Stone Cold Classics in a gated, locked off industrial estate. So I think we're fairly safe today. Now the R170 was launched in 1996 and it is unmistakably a Mercedes. Every inch of it screams Mercedes styling, certainly from that mid 90s period. And it looks an awful lot from the side, like a very small W202 and with good reason because it is a very small W202. It shares the platform and underpinnings and most of the mechanical parts of the C-Class W202 but on a much shorter platform. In fact, the overall length of the wheelbase is 2,400 millimeters. Interestingly, that's the same as a 190 or a 300 SL from back in the olden days. Now, something else it shares with the W202 is unfortunately the steel, which had a habit of rusting quite a lot. This one, which is for sale at uh, Stone Cold Classics, I know is not gonna be a rusty one because he checks his cars so carefully, but most of them, if you look, inside the arches, around the arches, under the rear subframes, you can see a lot of flakiness. This one appears to be absolutely perfect though. I'm, I'm amazed at the condition of this thing. When it first came out, it caused an absolute storm. With the MX-5 creating more of a market for roadsters and soft tops, then the public were hungry for something else, but something a bit posher, a bit more exclusive and more luxurious. And this answered that question. But doing it in such a way that it wasn't a convertible anymore, it was a folding hardtop. This was really exciting. I mean, there was a two year waiting list for this thing when it first came out because no one had seen one of these before. In fact, it was based on an early 90s concept also called the SLK or Sportlich Leicht Kurtz or Sporty Light Compact, which had a folding hardtop. Mercedes were so proud of the idea that they patented the idea in 1993. At the time, this, the C-Class had big square headlights, but the S-Class and the E-Class had sort of big, softer, wrap-aroundy, lozenge shaped lights. And this kind of falls somewhere in between, really, doesn't it? This grille was unique to this car, and it does look utterly different from anything else in the Mercedes stable. You've still got the, the in and out kind of curve that would be the regular blades of the grille, but this perforation is just mad and unique. It looks really good. It's, it's absolutely 1990s style all over. And it really, although it kind of fell into a, a doldrum of not being particularly desirable for maybe a few years ago, but now 90s stuff is just coming back so strong and it looks great now. The SLK was facelifted in early 2000, changing the front and rear bumpers, the grille and taillights. When the car first came out, it was only available with a four cylinder compressor, but then when the V6 came out, it transformed the car. It gave it the heart it always needed. The, the four cylinder, it was fast, but it lacked a certain amount of spirit. And this thumping German V6 absolutely gives it that spirit, that heart, that, that something special that makes it into an interesting car. Now, there's only about one in 20 of the survivors are the V6s, which makes them well worth seeking out, but harder to find. So this car today, a rust-free V6 is something pretty special. So this is a 3.2 litre or 3199cc M112 V6 engine. It's an 18 valve unit which makes 215 horsepower and 310 newton metres of torque, which is quite a lot. It returns about 25 mpg, which isn't too bad considering it's a big engine. Now back in the 90s, Mercedes-Benz were going through a bit of a dark time in quality, but their interiors were still fantastic. It's just so, so nice. And you climb in here and these bucket seats just give you a feeling of both quality and sportiness. In terms of 1990 spec, and this is a 2001 car, so it's still really kind of 1990 spec, these were absolutely loaded with, with goodies and toys. So you've got electric windows on both sides. Obviously, there's only two windows. You've got the electric roof. You've got headlight washers, electronic stability program, you've got central locking, you've got multiple modes on your alarm, so if you leave the roof down, it won't go off every time anything walks past or a breeze blows. You've got dual zone climate air conditioning, which is extremely posh. But the steering wheel feels very kind of modern and up to date for a, a millennial car, but it's got part wood, part leather, it does feel very nice indeed. The rest of the controls do have that certain slightly older, 
heavy hewn feel that previous Mercedes still had. So you've still got your left hand stalk for indicators and wipers, which is going to be familiar to anyone who's familiar with Mercedes. Your st slightly strange stalk just above it for your cruise control. And down here you've got the same virtually identical to most other Mercedes's for the last 20 years prior. Uh, light control, little dial that you twist uh, to do that. But then you look at the dials. Mercedes was trying to break its kind of fuddy-duddy, old person kind of feel and go a bit more modern, a bit more stylish, a bit more upbeat and youthful. And these dials really do that. You've got three white dials with chrome rings, which look absolutely fantastic. The middle one, the Speedo, goes up to 160, which in this car, with the V6, actually is only just enough. Over to the left hand side they've got a smaller dial with temperature which you can see quite clearly. Fuel gauge which is a little bit blocked off but to be honest V6 let's try and ignore that one anyway. And on the right hand side very easy to see the rev counter which red lines at 6000 rpm which is quite a lot for a V motor that's that's pretty high. Well that's fairly dark and somber in here it's black leather black carpet black dash you do have a lot of little chrome highlights everywhere and this dark wood which does give it a very classy feel and lifts things a little bit. I've seen a lot of these which have got in the leather so the, the seats themselves are two-tone like a red or a blue section or, or panel of leather which looks quite exciting and makes it look a bit different and daring but not in this one this is pure black pure class this is a bit more black and silver quite you know quite quite chic. Now moving around the car you've got quite a bit of storage. Now you've got big elasticated door bins in both doors, a big bin here on the elbow which is very large indeed you've got a lot of sandwiches in there, little roll back covered area here in the centre by the handbrake which is currently housing the locking wheel nut but it's just big enough to balance a mobile phone in perhaps and it's got the lighter socket in there so you can plug your sat nav phone charger what have you in there and in front of that the big one the most important switch in here which we'll come back to in a moment this big red thing here is the roof 25 seconds to track that but we'll, we'll return to that in a moment electric mirrors and then of course automatic gearbox there was a five-speed auto or a six-speed manual now being a mercedes most of these were sold with the five-speed auto and okay the, the six-speed manual was a bit agricultural but with this v6 motor which does turn it really from a roadster to a sports car it's the gearbox that really wakes this car up and makes it come a bit more alive now in front of the gear shift you've got a little ashtray which slides out very smoothly to the mercedes and i got a big just random size slot for putting small items in there this car still got its original mercedes-benz branded audio 10 cd head unit which must have looked incredibly modern in 2001 but it does look quite sort of basic and dated by today's standards but i rather like having it here because it fits the look of everything else there's a certain aesthetic to 90s design which is kind of quite simple quite pared down a few curves a lot of straight edges but the straight edges have got a slight curve to them as well like a bow almost if you look at this little bit of chrome here in the door panel it's almost straight but not quite that's a very 90s thing if you put a modern one in there it would look very out of place so i'm quite glad it's got that now looking above the rest of this uh, center console there is a random slide out tray which is just the right size for an iphone 10 it's a little bit wobbly and i've not discussed the t-shelf situation in this car yet that would work as a static t-shelf if the car was parked up but i would not at all risk that on the move that would be a disaster frankly waiting to happen and pour hot coffee or tea into your beautiful leather and wood so this is our main retractable t-shelf the rest of the dashboard is just tall enough but there's a bit of a slope on it so uh, i would not want to risk that and also this left hand t-shelf is also doubling up as a passenger airbag and then the slope does get quite bad i think for safety reasons to stop you putting cups of tea on there in case the airbag does deploy when there's a mug on there because that would hurt oh that's a very well damped glove box look at that go so slowly still going still going still going oh there we go it's done oh you could stand a cup in there actually it goes down to a complete horizontal the bottom the, this front sloping part does become a flat base so you could stand your tea in there you could actually have a, a fairly good uh, afternoon tea in that there's room for two cups and maybe a couple of biscuits that's quite good there's, there's a light in there as well which is uh, less important than your biscuit situation and behind the chairs you've got a little bit more storage there's a couple of cargo nets behind each seat and a central little fuck a fabric bag thing attached to the bulkhead and a couple of little snappy clips above that as well so if you've got something look i don't know like an umbrella you can pop it in this uh, holding area behind you now we need really 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 need to look at this uh, folding hard top 25 seconds as i said let's get that down and have a look It's 
sunshine. Now, before I take this thing for a drive, there's one last area to look at, the trunkle area. Not power assisted, and once the roof is in here, you are very much in convertible car territory. The uh, flappy hang down bit of uh, material guides you as to what area you can use inside the boot. Um, obviously it's diminished to about 50% when you're having the roof down so the car looks good and you're in soft top mode. But it's still just about enough. If you're going shopping for the week, you get a fair few carrier bags in there. And also in here are your emergency essentials. Under the carpet, you've got a run flat tire, which you need to inflate, but it is there. It's an actual solid wheel with a jack, emergency triangle, and behind the little panel on the side, you've got the access to the pump for the roof. So if you need to service that, change the relay, it's all easily accessible behind this little panel here. And of course, another Mercedes fantastic little, every car gets it, and it's a nice point to have if you're getting a second out one. The original Mercedes-Benz first aid kit, which always looks so good. Right, let's fire up that V6. It's kind of muted, but at the same time, it's got a delicious, crisp roar to it. Now, as you all know, I'm no fan of an automatic. And people say you shouldn't buy a Mercedes with a manual. And I'm one of those weird people who did buy a Mercedes with a manual. So let's see, does this auto suit the character of this V6? Well, it's astonishingly smooth, I can tell you that straight away. Oh, it's nice. It's very, very nice indeed to use. That kind of little grumbly warble is just so good to listen to. And there's something really special about looking down here, those twin bulges on the front of the bonnet. They just give it a real kind of fighter plane kind of feel. I'm not gonna use the uh, Spitfire analogy, obviously being in a German car, maybe it's more of a, a Messerschmitt. In fact, thinking back, did the Messerschmitt 109 have those kind of twin bulges down the front of its cowl? I'm not sure, I can't remember, I think it may have done. Now this seat is multi-way adjustable electrically, so it's like six-way electric adjustment. So whatever your height and your build, you can find more or less exactly the right uh, position. Although it's worth noting these bucket seats are fairly tight. Not too tight. I mean, I've got like a 40-inch chest and there are, there's a bit of room, wiggle room. If I had a big coat on, it might be a little bit tight. Right, everything's following the tractor now, so we can see what a V6 can do. But well, it sounds amazing. This thing sounds so good. I'm hoping there's not too, wind, too much wind noise buffeting. And then as soon as you hit sort of a cruising speed, it's just instantly silent. This thing's wonderful. And because this is set up like a sports car, it is very firm, way firmer than you'd expect from like a contemporary C-Class that it's based on. That doesn't mean the ride's uncomfortable. It's still nice to be in. Oh, E39, estate. I think that's a fairly high spec one, judging by the wheels too. So as I was saying, it's still a pleasant ride. It's a nice, comfortable ride, but it's got that kind of firmness and sporty, jitter is the wrong word, but it's the closest thing I can think of at the moment. I can see the Nikon on my left is vibrating a bit, which does kind of sum that up. I think I'm gonna pull over and move that camera somewhere else. Oh, this thing does sound good and it picks up really well too. This car is currently for sale, or about to be for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rootam in Kent. Please check out the website in the description below where you can find all the details. Uh, the positioning of this car in the market was interesting. It was kind of someone who wanted a sports car like an MX-5, but didn't necessarily want the manual roof, the hard work of a manual gearbox, and wanted a bit more of a luxurious interior. Its main rival really was the Boxster, which was so similar in concept it was untrue. A compact, lightweight, convertible, two-seater sports car, rear-wheel drive, and lots of power with German quality. They really were born rivals. the Boxster in all its forms has now become something of a sought after, not a collector's car exactly, but typical Porsche tax applies. Because there are so few of the V6 SLKs out there, they've kind of slipped through the cracks of becoming a collector car just yet. I'm loath to admit it, but the automatic gearbox 
is very good, it's extremely smooth and it does change down very well. The suspension is independent all the way around. It's got multi-link rear with coils obviously and, and double wishbones at the front. And of course anti-roll bars front and back. Meaning you've got extremely good control. I did read it's got recirculating ball steering but I'm not quite sure about that. It does have extremely light steering. The power assistance is not intrusive but it does mean you don't have to work hard and it loads up quite nicely as you turn into a bend. But the thing that gets you all the time is that wonderful engine note. The roads are still fairly quiet, so we can give this a quick 0 to 60 trial. Apparently, it'll do 152 miles an hour and 0 to 60 in 6.9 seconds. Well, I'm not going to time it, but let's just see how it feels when you mash the loud pedal. Yeah, it comes up pretty rapidly. It just feels so solid, so planted on the road. Although it's only a little car, it weighs 1,305 kilos, which is about the same as my big Volvo 740. So that's not massively, massively heavy, but at the same time, for a small thing like this, it's got a fair bit of mass, density, gravitas, if you like. Now at the time, especially in compressor form, when these came out, People didn't really take them seriously. They kind of thought them was a bit hairdressery. But that was the four cylinder compressor. Stick a V6 in it, this car is just transformed. It really does. I, I know I said when I looked at the engine earlier, it gives it a different heart and a different soul. It really does. You can feel kind of the weight of the engine in the front and just the sound it makes and everything about it. Just, oh, it's just marvelous. Oh, even with the roof down, Okay, I've got the windows up for the microphone's sake, but there's virtually no wind buffeting at all, and I've got the wrong haircut for a convertible, so I've got my hat on. But my hat doesn't feel particularly buffeted either. So although this is a really quite rapid car, it doesn't feel sporty in the same way that a Boxster does. It feels more of a GT luxury thing. Although it does have great handling to back up that performance. This feels like the kind of car you could drive a long way and be really comfortable and relaxed and enjoy the drive, whether you're going for a, a spirited blast down a back lane or taking it on the motorway for a long journey. Oh, nice little echo of those walls there. <laughs> the car kicks down very eagerly. I'm surprised how eagerly it does kick down, in fact. We've got a couple of modes on the gearbox. We've got winter mode, which will sort of delay your, your changes, soften all the shifts. And we've got sport mode, which will wake the gearbox up a bit. I'm going to say I do think I would prefer it with a manual still, but those cars are ridiculously rare to try and find one of them. One area of concern with convertible cars is uh, often safety, rollover in particular. Now, because this is a folding metal hardtop, when the metal hardtop's up, you've got a metal hardtop, so you're pretty safe then. But to make it even more safe, you've got these big old rollover hoops mounted behind both of the front seats. So if the worst did happen, you'd be pretty well protected. I have to say this car is a little bit glorious. I'm really, really enjoying it. So I'm not a big convertible fan, but the last week or so I have kind of been browsing the classifieds. A lot of people did flag up to me the um, Punto convertible that was for sale on eBay. And I was thinking long and hard about that car. In fact, I thought too long and too hard because someone else has bought it. And I've had a look at a couple of other sort of Rover 200 convertibles on eBay as well. But driving something like this, as much as I love a Fiat and a Rover, this just feels so solid, so hewn. When I remember the Punto, it would drip from this point here on the uh, top of the A-post onto your leg if it was raining. I know for a fact that won't happen in this car. And I also don't even need to bother putting the roof up to be able to tell you that when that hard top's up, there's no wind noise. In fact, there's virtually no wind noise with the roof down. This is one of those cars where they just 
spent so much time and effort refining and refining it. It's just, everything is right. They've made everything just right. So here we are. I don't like convertibles. I'm not a big fan of soft tops, but I adore this car. I didn't even ask him how much it was for sale for. And now I'm gonna go and have to ask that question. Oh, it's just so smooth. When you're just tickling the throttle, it's just a beautiful little it, it just purrs, it's like driving velvet. I like the two-tone steering wheel, the wood and the leather. I like the wooden dash, I like the chrome rings. Oh, everything about it is just a nice thing. I want to hand my credit card over and drive home in this car. If only it had a decent T-shelf, then I'd be really sold on it. Oh, an ST220 Mondeo. Oh, another car from my list of cars I would really quite like to have. Everyone's got the fun cars out today. I don't want those hybrid KNs. That's a car I don't want, but I suppose I should probably try and test one one day to see what the fuss is about. Okay, that's interesting. A lifted Range Rover. Very cool. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in an R170 SL K320. It's a car I didn't really take seriously as a new car when it was just a four cylinder compressor. But now I've finally driven one of the V6 ones. I could find myself wanting to hand over my credit card before I leave uh, Stone Cold's offices today. If you've enjoyed this, please hit like, please hit subscribe, share with your friends. It's great to be back out and driving again now that we're allowed to go back to work. So uh, join me again next time in maybe the workshop, maybe another car if we're still allowed out to continue driving cars to work. See you again soon. The SLK was facelifted in early 2000, changing the front and rear bumpers, the grille and taillights.